Uh, so we'll come to the case uh, that we have treated. So we had a 35 year old male. Uh, this was done last year uh, after uh, or actually during the second uh, wave of COVID who present who had no previous comorbidities other than being slightly obese uh, came with a two day history of breathlessness <clears throat> to the hospital on admission his saturation was 70% on room air with respiratory of 50 and a heart rate of 110. So essentially this patient is in severe respiratory distress. Uh, so we intubated him for hypoxia and respiratory distress. And uh, because we couldn't get his saturations up, we uh, proned him immediately. Uh, but despite all our efforts, this patient uh, had, we couldn't get his uh, oxygenation under control. This PO2, the best we could achieve was a PO2 of 50 millimeters of mercury on a 100% oxygen and a PEEP of 16. And also uh, CO2 was 70 uh, with a pH of 7. So essentially this patient is in severe respiratory failure despite optimal ventilation. Uh, so we plan to go ahead and uh, put him on ECMO. So this was the uh, lung picture. Uh, this was just after cannulation, but essentially you can see that uh, basically, his lungs are completely white out. You can see the air bronchogram and his not, not, none of his parenchyma is actually visible. So essentially, this patient had no uh, gas exchange through his lungs. And if he hadn't put him on ECMO, he would have died in a couple of hours due to uh, respiratory failure. So we use uh, normally use a femoral jugular approach. Uh, I don't know if you can see it, but there is a cannula over here that you can see. That's the femoral cannula. So you put the cannula up onto the IVC, almost at the level of the liver, the hepatic vein and the IVC junction. And then you have a return cannula over here. Uh, so that's the jugular cannula. Okay. Uh, so there is something called as a REST score, which we use to determine uh, what the outcome or a survival predictor model for all of these patients. Essentially, it looks as uh, whether what is the patient's age, whether he's immunocompromised. Uh, anybody who's ventilated for more than 48 hours, their chances of survival become lesser. Because when you're ventilating these patients who have such severe respiratory failure, you are not doing lung protective ventilation. Uh, and then what is the cause of the ARDS and whether he has any other organ dysfunction? So based on the score, you get a survival prediction. This is available online. Anybody can go in and use it. So it essentially gives you a chance to explain to the patients as to what kind of chances are we looking at if this patient goes on to ECMO. Uh, so essentially when we uh, initiate ECMO, we candidate uh, these patients ourselves. Uh, we use a Seldinger technique to candidate these patients. So ultrasound guided uh, puncture of the femoral vein a guide wire, uh, which is a uh, long ultra stiff guide wire of uh, 260 centimeters is inserted. And then we do serial dilatations. Uh, it is something like inserting a dialysis catheter, but it's much, much bigger. So 25 French, 28 French catheters, which are very, very big. So you have to look at what the vein diameter is and then determine what size cannula you want to use. And then essentially the same thing you do with the jugular as well. Uh, so you need a cannula guide wire and your machine obviously has to be ready. That is prepped by the perfusionist. You need a perfusionist as well. Uh, imaging. So uh, different centers uh, do different sorts of imaging. Uh, ideally, you would want to do it under pleuro guidance so that you can always know what, where the guide wire is at. But uh, we do it under ultrasound guidance. We do it bedside. These venovenous ECMO at least can be done at the bedside. Uh, and if you're experienced enough, you should not have any complications, but obviously the risk of bleeding is much, much higher when you're using cannulas of this big size and vascular complications are present as well. Uh, so you need at least two doctors uh, who can cannulate and then you need a perfusionist who can uh, prime the machine and also uh, staff on standby to uh, deal with any uh, complications which may arise. So these are some of the cannulas that are available in uh, the basically uh, the market. So you have either uh, Mackey back cannulas or sometimes you have uh, what's called as a, so as I said, when I say Vino Venus, you can either have two cannulae in two different uh, veins. So femoral jugular 
or you have something called as the Avalon cannula, which uh, is a single cannula, but has uh, two different outlets. Uh, so you have one cannula, which uh, can be used for drainage and return. It's placed in the right tubular. Uh, yeah. Uh, and then when we come to the machine, Basically, this is what a basic uh, Mackey uh, rotaflow machine looks like. This is uh, an ECMO machine. In the front, you have a display and dials and everything. Uh, the most important part of it is obviously the pump. Uh, so the pump uh, basically looks something uh, like this at the back of the machine. Uh, it uses what is called as a centrifugal pump. So if you've seen a dialysis machine, you have something called a roller pump, which crushes the blood and pushes it forward. Uh, for the flows that we're trying to achieve on the ECMO, we can't use a roller pump because five to six liters per minute, we'll have a lot of hemolysis. So essentially uh, you have a magnet, which is there, which spins at a very high uh, RPM up to 3000, 4000 RPM. It generates a lot of centrifugal force, which sucks in the blood and pushes it out. And then the oxygenator, which is used. Uh, so this is a modern uh, oxygenator. It is made up of something called as PMP, which is a uh, polymethyl pentene. It's a hollow fiber oxygenator. Uh, basically, it, it looks like a dialysis uh, cartridge, but a uh, different material. So you have blood flow on one axis, gas flow on the other axis, and water flow on one axis to maintain temperature. So this is what uh, oxygenates and decarboxinates the blood. And then you have a blender, uh, basically, to uh, achieve gas flows. And you can also set the FiO2 or what we call as FdO2 on the uh, blender. So essentially, if you put all of these elements together, this is what a basic, basic uh, circuit diagram looks like. So from the patient, the blood comes out. It goes through the centrifugal pump. From the pump, it goes through to the oxygenator. Uh, and then... Uh, it goes back to the patient, okay? So when we set up a patient, so now that you've got the cannulas in one in the femoral, one in the jugular, you've confirmed the position, guide wires are out, uh, you've given the heparin uh, to these patients. Once you establish a flow to the machine, making sure that you don't have any air, you have to set the blood flow. So normally we set it at about three and a half to four liters per minute. Uh, initial uh, oxygen, we set it at 100%. And sweep gas flow, we slowly turn it up to achieve the same as the blood flow. So if you're achieving a blood flow of 4 liters per minute, you want the sweep gas flow of 4 liters per minute as well. Uh, so once you've established this patient on it, essentially what, what is happening is the machine is doing all of the gas exchange. So it's essential that you have blood flow constantly through uh, the machine. Uh, if the blood flow isn't happening, you have you get something called as shattering, where the, uh, the pipes move around and there's no blood flow. Uh, so you have to manage that as well. Most commonly it is because this patient is hypovolemic. So as soon as you start the patient on ECMO, there's an inflammatory response in the patient because your blood is coming in contact with an external source. So most of these patients require some sort of fluid resuscitation. And uh, <clears throat> there's something called recirculation. We'll talk about it a little later as well. Okay, so when you're managing the machine, let's say that everything is going on fine and then suddenly you have uh, these... In the machine, obviously you have to monitor the flow. So the flow is monitored. You get a readout on the machine display as to how much, how fast the pump is moving. So how many RPM the pump is moving and what sort of blood flow you're getting across because of that. You also have to monitor the pressures. So we have usually have three pressures, P1, P2 and P3. Now P1 is the pressure which is measured before the pump over here. P2 is measured before the oxygenator and P3 is measured after the oxygenator. So P1 as a pressure, which is pre-pump, is always a negative pressure, right? Because as I said, because the pump moves very fast, it's causing a lot of negative pressure, which is sucking in the blood into the pump. So anything before the pump from the patient's drainage cannula to the pump is all negative pressure. 
so if there is a break in the circuit over here for whatever reason uh you cause air embolism because once it's open to the atmosphere it sucks in air and then that goes into the pump and then the pump it doesn't work the circuit after the pump is all positive pressure right so if anything if the circuit breaks over here for whatever reason you will have blood spraying all over uh but you won't be causing any air embolism now when the blood goes through the oxygenator over here because as i've told you that the oxygenator has a lot of small uh, membranes inside it so essentially the resistance on the oxygenator is high so you have a build up of pressure and then the pressure drops when <clears throat> it goes across the oxygenator so the what that's what the difference of pressure is called as the transmembrane pressure so based on these pressures you can make a few diagnoses so if the pre pump pressure that is a negative pressure goes very negative it means there's a problem between the drainage cannula and the pump so either one of the uh, tubings is kinked or uh, the patient is hypovolemic so he, there's no flow coming across the pump uh, if the uh, pressure the pre pump pressure increases the p2 increases and the p3 remains the same it means that there's something wrong with the oxygenator so as i said because it's high resistance and it's got a lot of surface area there's a high chance of clots formation and uh, that's what happens over here as well so if the tmp goes up you have to look at uh, whether the oxygenator is going up now that's about that's the basic management of the machine once you come to the management of the patient every day a head to toe examination has to be done because of the kind of blood flows the kind of anticoagulation which we are using in these patients so the cns examination includes an eye examination because what we are worried about is a cns bleed because of the amount of heparin which we are using in these patients uh, so essentially sometimes the first thing to find out is that the patient has unequal pupils if he's bled in the brain then sedation initially these patients are have a very high respiratory drive because of the ards so you might have to sedate and sometimes even paralyze these patients not sometimes almost all the all of the time you have to paralyze these patients and then uh, you will a uh, sedation hold every day to assess what the neurology is of these patients now uh, in respiratory examination the ventilation parameters we'll talk about it in a little while chest x ray needs to done day to look for the progression of the lung disease or resolution of lung disease look for the positions so you don't want the cannulas moving in and out uh, you also look at the lung compliance on the ventilator so daily measurement of the lung compliances and the blood gases of the patient uh, so that uh, there is you don't have uh, any problems with gas exchange also every day the lines uh, of the patient needs to be checked because these patients are very prone for infections uh, nutrition all of these patients because ecmo is a very highly inflammatory uh, procedure so these patients are catabolic so if you don't feed them well they start losing muscle mass and <clears throat> it uh, basically uh, means that uh, these people uh, or uh, these people basically lose muscle mass and then you have have problems later uh, getting them off the ventilator and obviously we have to manage the primary cause uh, of the respiratory failure because as i said ecmo is a support system it is not a treatment uh, by itself so unless you manage the primary cause this patient is not going to be able to come out of the this thing. so when uh, when we are looking at oxygenation of these patients initially when you put them on the ecmo the lungs are not working at all so all of the gas exchange is being done by the machine so on the machine if you want to increase the oxygenation <coughs> so you have to increase the blood flow So initially, as I said, you set about four liters of blood flow, and if you are not able to achieve enough oxygenation, you have to increase the blood flow. And carbon dioxide removal uh, depends on the sweep gas flow. So, uh, the gas flow you set on the blender is what is called as the sweep gas flow. Uh, 
and that is essentially uh, if you have to put it into uh, ventilator terms sweep cast flow is basically somewhat like your minute ventilation so as we know carbon dioxide removal depends on uh, minute ventilation so sweep cast flow determines carbon dioxide removal <clears throat> so if a patient is hypoxic uh, uh, it is either due to decreased blood flow, so you're not achieving the uh, required blood flow for these patients, so you need to increase the blood flow. You have something called recirculation. So what is recirculation? Basically, uh, as I've said, there's one jugular return cannula and a oxygen uh, drainage cannula in the IVC. So uh, essentially, if whatever oxygenated blood is, which is going through the jugular cannula, if the same thing is being sucked up by the drainage cannula, then you're essentially short circuiting it so that oxygenated blood is just going around and around in the machine without actually uh, getting into the patient's body. How do you diagnose this? Basically, you look at the color change between the drainage and the return cannula. Uh, so essentially, the drainage blood should be dark uh, color because it's deoxygenated and the return cannula blood should be bright red because it's oxygenated. In recirculation, what happens is that uh, both the cannulas, uh, both the bloods look the same. So what you need to do is basically probably reposition the cannula uh, or uh, sometimes decreasing the flow also causes a uh, decrease in recirculation because essentially what you're doing is you're decreasing the negative pressure in the drainage cannula. The last one, uh, which uh, may cause hypoxia, is increased requirement of the patient. So this is a little complicated to understand. Uh, for that, you have to understand the physiology. So let's say the patient's cardiac output is about 5 liters per minute, right? So if my ECMO flow is 3.5 liters per minute and there's no gas exchange happening in the lungs, so 3.5 liters of blood, I'm... Uh, completely oxygenating and one and a half liters of blood there's no oxygenation at all right so essentially when it goes out of the uh, left side of the heart you get uh, about 90 percent saturation of blood right because you're oxygenating more than 60 percent of the blood essentially the whatever is going through the lungs is being shunted out right so you're achieving about 90 percent saturation but let's say for whatever reason the patient's cardiac output increases to 10 liters Either he has a fever or this patient is awake and anxious, so his cardiac output is increased. And your ECMO flow is still 3.5 liters per minute. Now, 3.5 liters is being completely oxygenated, but 6.5 liters of blood is not being oxygenated at all. Right? So, whatever oxygenated blood is there from the ECMO is not enough to oxygenate the rest of the 6.5 liters. So essentially, you will then be getting about 70% saturation, whatever you do. So for these patients, you need to decrease the oxygen uh, requirement of the body. So if he's got fever, treat the fever. If uh, uh, by the paracetamol or cooling the patient down, increasing the sedation. Or sometimes uh, if not, none of this works, what we do is we give uh, beta, beta blockers to these patients because that reduces your heart rate and your cardiac output. So we, then these people's uh, oxygen levels improve. So how do you manage hypoxia in these patients, right? So first look at whether there is any malposition or recirculation. If it is present, then we re reposition the cannula. Then look for filter dysfunction, lung complications such as pneumothorax. And uh, if any of this is there, we need to change the filter. After that, you increase the ECMO flow to up to 7 liters per minute, which we rarely do because it causes a lot of hemolysis. And either, uh, you know, the hypoxia is improved or it is not. And sometimes uh, we also increase the hemoglobin of these patients because anemia, hyperdynamic circulation. Uh, if none of this works, then either uh, hypothermia or esmolol, or uh, sometimes we, uh, we cause, uh, we accept the lower uh, oxygen level.